Okay, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be finishing up the discussion of closed hashing and uh, on, um, the types of hashing we've been looking at in general. And then we'll discuss extendable hashing as well, or start discussing it, which is sort of a whole different structure in its own right, in a way, with some similarities to what we've done, but some differences too. So, where we left off last time was I had introduced the idea of double hashing. And we had said we're going to sort of take our probing function, our, our overall sort of uh, cell, genera cell generation function, the uh, function we're using to generate our, our indices here, is a function of the number and how many probes we've done so far. And we say that that was our hash function for our initial location plus the probing function itself. And we said this time around we'd make it a function of i and x, the whole thing a function of the table size. And so then that means we have to define, firstly, some h of x you know, whatever our initial hash function will be, we will also need an h2 of x. That will generate some something as well, because we said for double hashing, this is only, the h2 of x is only needed for double hashing. But for double hashing, we have that f of i comma x is equal to i times h2 of x. And so, as a result, um, we have then that we will calculate the second hash function on x multiplied by the number of probes you've done, and that is our offset. And so, as we said last time, then we end up with you know h of x plus zero because zero times h two of x, h of x plus one times h two of x. I'll go ahead and write it up there as well. h of x plus 2 times h2 of x, and so on. So by way of an example, which we didn't really have time for last time, we can say we'll stick again with h of x equals x mod 7. And let's say h2 of x equals 5 minus x mod 5. I also said he's scanning in some of these, so let me make sure it's clear rather than a scratch out. So, 5 minus x mod 5. Now, why did I decide on that function? Because it'll work. Um, you're not going to be required on an, an exam to come up with your own unique hash function for anything. Um, as you may have seen from the past exams on the web page, we often, if we're going to give you a hashing problem, we'll give those to you. The class isn't about figuring out hash functions. Certainly, we've discussed, you know, the idea of what makes a good hash function, but... Um, don't worry, the pattern I just chose here was to use the largest prime that's still less than the table size and then use that in, in that pattern, that number minus x mod that number. That's the pattern I used. It's a quick and easy pattern that gives us at least a decent offset, but uh, you don't, you don't worry about knowing that for the exam. There's, you know, a whole science behind hash function selection that we're not going to get into. This is just sort of the quick and dirty stuff for the sake of the examples. Um, so anyway, we'll go with that as h2 of x. And so let's have our table. Now, ultimately, the results in terms of how the table ends up looking aren't going to be too different from what we've already seen, simply because we're dealing with a very small table here. So after you just insert a few, you know, three or four values, the table is already pretty well filled up, regardless of what probing strategy you're using. Uh, the point here is to, in this exercise, to sort of look at the number of collisions we have and to see how it's going to differ from quadratic probing. So. Given that, let's start out by uh, inserting 16, which I believe was the first example I used last time. So we know h of 16 is 2. 16 minus 7 is 2. And so I can go ahead and put that in there, or ah, 16. Um, so let's try 30 next. We insert 30. h of 30 is 2, and so that's a collision. So since it's a collision, we then say, well, what I want now is h of 30 plus 1 times h2 of 30. 
And the question is, what's H2 of 30? Well, 30 minus 5 is 0. 5 minus 0 is 5. So the offset is 5. For 30, what we're going to be trying is 2 plus 0 times 5, which we already tried, then 2 plus 1 times 5, then 2 plus 2 times 5, and so on. And 2 plus 0 times 5 is full. 2 plus 1 times 5 is 7. Mod 7 is 0, and that's not full. So I can write 30 up there. Likewise, if I try, say, 37, 37 mod 7 is also 2, so there's a collision with 16. But 37 in H2 of x, H2 of 37, well, 37 mod 5 is going to be 2, and 5 minus 2 is 3. So the offset for 37 is 3, which means the values we're trying here are 2 plus 0 times 3, 2 plus 1 times 3, and so on. And 2 plus 0 times 3 is a collision, but 2 times 1 plus 2 plus 1 times 3 is going to be 5. And so I, I can go ahead and write 37 into cell 5 because that is open. And finally, let's try inserting 9. Uh, 9, of course, hashes a 2, and that's a collision. H2 of 9 is going to be 1. 9 mod 5 is 4. 5 minus 4 is 1. And so what we're trying for 9 is going to be, going to be 2 plus 0 times 1, 2 plus 1 times 1, and so on. And 2 plus 1 times 1 is 3. And so that's 3, and we can go ahead and put 9 there. So the first value we insert, of course, never requires a collision because the table is completely empty. After that, with quadratic probing, 30 would have collided with 16 before being inserting, inserted into the table. 37 would have collided with 16 and 30 before being inserted into the table. And 9 would have collided with 16, 30, and 37 before being inserted into the table. They would have followed the same sequence. That was the idea of secondary clustering. And even when using linear probing, we had secondary clustering, the idea that things that hashed the same starting point follow the same sequence and all collide with each other. But the issue there was with linear probing that the primary clustering effect was so severe that we didn't really care about uh, secondary clustering. With quadratic probing, we managed to remove the primary clustering um, effect, and so secondary clustering now became what we worried about. And now we've gotten rid of secondary clustering as well. Now, Instead of six collisions, which I would have had with quadratic probing, 30 would have collided with 16, 37 with 16 and 30, and 9 with 16, 30, and 37. And so that would have been 1 plus 2 plus 3, or six collisions total. Now we've only had three collisions. 30 collided with 16 and then went into a cell. 37 collided with 16 and then went into a cell. 9 collided with 16 and then went into a cell. This is possible because... The second cell that we try for 30 is different than the second cell we try for 37, is different than the second cell we try for 9. And so as far as theoretical performance goes, this is about as close as we can get to randomly tossing something in the table. You know, we said, well, we want the hash function to pick a cell, we try there. If it's a collision, early on we have said it would be nice to just randomly pick a different cell and put our value there, but of course then we can't find it. This double hashing idea where a variety of different values will have different second cell attempts and different third cell attempts and so on is going to be about as close as we can get to saying, well, randomly pick some other cell and try that. And so this enables us to do that in a way that doesn't um, cause secondary clustering. So I can have a bunch of stuff that hashes to two and still not get too many collisions except that they'll all coll collide with the first, the first one. So that's the idea here, um, and we can, if we want to, to kind of inspect this a little bit closer, we can sort of check out the probing sequences. For 16, we said H2 of um, 16 was equal to uh, 4, because 16 mod 5 is 1, 5 minus 1 is 4. So the probing sequence would have been 2, that's 2 plus 0 times, remember that the formula here is always h of x plus i times h2 of x. So we're talking here about 2. 
that's going to be 2 plus 0 times 4. 2 plus 1 times 4 is 6. 2 plus 2 times 4 is 2 plus 8, which is 10. Mod 7 is 3. 2 plus 3 times 4 is 2 plus 12, which is 14. Mod 7 is 0. 2 plus 5 times 4 is 22. Mod 7 is 1. 2 plus 6 times 4 is 26. Mod 7 is 5. 2 plus 7 times 4 is going to be back to 2. It will be 30. So we have only here in this table, um, no, I missed one here. 7 times 4, 28 times 2. Oh, 2 plus 6 times. I'm, I skipped one entirely. Sorry. Um, let's try. 2 plus 0 times 4. 2 plus 1 times 4 is 6. 2 plus 2 times 4 is 10. Mod 7 is 3. 14 mod 7 is 0. Oh, I forgot. 2 plus 4 times 4. Sorry. That's 18. Mod 7 is going to be um, 4. And then 1. And then 5. Sorry about that. Um, hold on, I need to change the battery in the microphone. It's dying. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, microphone conks out sometimes. It was getting low on battery power. So, back to the hashing. What we have here then is... Um, that's after zero probes, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And if you check this out in the table, what we're basically doing is counting. Because at each step, we're adding a larger multiple, uh, multiple of four. What this boils down to is we start here at two plus zero times four. What we're essentially doing now is skipping down four cells to get to two plus one times four. We're adding in one more four, so we go from two to six. And then we'd skip down four more cells to go from 2 plus 1 times 4 to 2 plus 2 times 4. So we're skipping from 6 to 0, 1, 2, 3. And then 4, 5, 6, 0. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2. And we're back to the beginning. So your sequence there is basically skipping down every four cells, which is what you'd expect if mathematically you're adding one more 4 to your total each time. Likewise, for 30, we had said h2 of 30 was equal to um, 5. And so, in that previous example, that's what we had. Therefore, we get 2, um, 1 times 5 plus 2 is 7, mod 7 is 0. 2 times 5 is 10, plus 2 is 12, mod 7 is 5. 3 times 5 is 15, plus 2 is 17, mod 7 is 3. 4 times 5 is 20, plus 2 is 22, mod 7 is 1. 5 times 5 is 25, plus 2 is 27, mod 7 is 6. 6 times 5 is 30, plus 2 is 32, mod 7 is 4. And we can see the same thing here. 2, skip down 5 cells, 3, three 4, 5, 6, 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 5, 6, 0, 1, 2 brings us back to the beginning. So those are two different ways of looking at this. You can actually run the calculation each time and say, you know, start plus 1, or start plus 0 times h2 of x, start plus 1 times h2 of x, start plus 8, 1, start plus 2 times h2 of x, start plus 3 times h2 of x, and so on. Or you can just say, well, I'm just going to progressively count down h2 of x cells each time. And so then, likewise, when we do 37, h2 of 37 happen to be 3. So we end up with 2, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That would be the probing sequence for 37. And for 9, where h2 of uh, 9 was equal to 1. We had 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, and 1. So we start at the same location for all four of those. We end up at have different probing sequences. And so, of course, for 16, the table had been empty. We were able to insert 16 right away. 
Then we had a collision and went to zero for 30. We had a collision and went to five for 37. Had a collision, went to three for nine. And that's all that's going on here. The probing sequences involved are the, those, and then we make the rest of it work exactly like we've already discussed for insert and, and remove and lookup. Only thing that's changed here is the particular probing sequence for a different value. And so there's examples of four things that have to two and how they have identical probing sequences. So that said, there's only a few more other things to mention here uh, regarding exactly what the uh, um, probing sequence or, or uh, H2 of X can have. Firstly, you know, one very important thing, H2 of X cannot be zero, ever. You do not want to design a function that could ever return zero for any value. And indeed, we couldn't before when we said 5 minus x mod 5. Well, what we have there is um, x mod 5 gives us a number from 0 to 4. And so the whole thing gives us a number from 5 to 1. And so the overall 5 minus x mod 5 expression can never be 0. And hopefully it's clear to see why it can't be 0 if we're saying h of x plus 1 times 0, h of x plus 2 times 0, and so on, and, you know, plus 3 times 0, and so on and so forth. We're trying the exact same cell every single time. So definitely h2 of x being 0 isn't going to do us any good. We want this to be some uh, legitimate value. Similarly, this is where it gets really important that the table size is a prime number. With linear probing, we were able to get away with it, uh, the table size not being prime. Quadratic probing had its own issues with table size, you know, and, and the uh, being half full, regardless of what the table size was. However, we wanted prime table size because imagine if we had a table size, for example, of 8. We have cell 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And let's say I hash initially to 3, so whatever my x is, h of x is 3, and let's say h2 of x is equal to 4. Well, what we're going to be trying here is cell 3, and then 4 more cells would give us 7, and 4 more cells would give us 3. Or in other words, what we could say is we have 3 plus 0 times 4, 3 plus 1 times 4, 3 plus 2 times 4, 3 plus 3 times 4. Those would be the first four elements in this probing sequence. That's equal to 3. 3 plus 1 times 4 is 7. 3 plus 2 times 4 is 3 plus 8, which is 11. Mod 8 is 7, or I'm sorry, is 3. 3 plus 3 times 4 is 3 plus 12, which is 15, mod 8 is 7, and so on. And hopefully you see the pattern here. We just jump from cell 3 to cell 7 to cell 3 to cell 7, and so on. The problem is because h2 of x evenly divides the table size, we're able to ju just jump to certain cells. When the table size is, is a little bit different, when the table size is prime, for example, we were okay. We managed to hit every cell. And on the previous slide, we had four different probing sequences. Each of them covered all seven cells over the course of seven probes. Well, what's going on here is because I can have a limited number of addings of additions of four to my starting location and get back to my starting location because we have an even number of fours, we have an integral number of fours in the table, in the table size, that means after a fewer number of probes, I will get, in fact, after sort of one rotation through the table, I'll get back to the starting point. Likewise, if my H2 of X had been 2, I'd have cells 3, 5, 7, 1, and then I'd be back to 3. So that'll always be the case if your hash 2 function, H2, if your value can divide the table size, then in one rotation, one kind of traversal through the table, you'll land back on the cell you started at of skipping over a bunch of cells. 
of course, if your if your H two is one, then that's that's a little bit different, as it was for nine last time. Then you hit every cell going through the table. But if your H two of X is greater than one and yet divides the table size, then you're skipping over cells each time, and you come back to where you start, and you'll always skip over those cells. It's, you can rotate around the table all you want. You'll always skip over those same cells. I'm skipping over here. One, two, zero, four, five, and six. No matter how large my eye gets. And so clearly that's not a desirable thing. We'd like over n probes to have hit every all n cells in the table. And so as a result, we don't want an H2 of x to be able to divide the table size. And since our table size can grow as we as we need it to, you know what we're going to talk about that right after this. But since we, we've talked about alluded to it already that we'd increase the table size when things get too full, um, then since we can't guarantee what the table size will be at any given point, uh, we can't design a hash function specifically to guard against a, a particular table size and its divisors. And so instead we say make the table size prime all the time. That way you know regardless what your hash function is, it's not going to um, divide the table. No value that that function can take on it can evenly divide the table size. And so those are the two things to watch out for for your, second, for your double hashing function. You want to make sure it can't be zero so that you do have a real offset and you don't want that offset to divide the table size and so that's where it's very important to make the table size prime. And so that's it for probing sequences. Um, we've got now, uh, we talked about linear and quadratic and uh, linear probing, quadratic probing, double hashing and those are the three different probing sequences that involve close, that close hashing can make use of. There's others too but those, that's going to be what we focus on here. And uh, um, closed hashing then follows the rules we talked about for insert and remove and find, and it uses one of those three kinds of probing, and, and we're done. So the only other thing we have to talk about now, very briefly, is the idea of rehashing. And this is our table increase sequence. When I say I've got, for example, seven cells, when I decide the table is too filled, Whatever that load factor happens to be. So I say, well, I'm going to allow it to be 50% full, but when it, once it's 50% full, then I'm going to want to increase the size of the table. Or I might say, I'll allow it to be 70% full, and once it's 70% full, I want to increase the size of the table. And, and, or, or if it's an open hashing table, then we might you know, let the load factor reach 3 and then say, well, now, okay, we have a load factor of 3, it's time to increase the table. So whatever we happen to pick, there's some signal the load factor tells us in some way, okay, the table's too full, it's time to increase the size. And all rehashing really is, is we say, create a larger table. to traverse down the old table. So we just traverse down the old table. And then step three, we rehash the values one by one. So I don't need to try and find the values in the table in the order I inserted them in to begin with. We don't care about that. We just simply say grab the values in the table one by one and rehash them. And so we can just traverse down the table and say, as we see valid values, rehash them into the larger table. Which is why it's nice that our hash function always is dependent on the size. We're always saying mod size, because that way, when we, excuse me, when we increase the uh, uh, table size from seven cells to however many cells, the hash function should now distribute the values over all of these indices rather than on all, over all of those indices. So we don't you know if this is, say, size you know, uh, 30, 38 or 37, then we don't want to distribute from 0 to 6. We want to distribute from 0 to 36. And so that's how that will work. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what about insertion now? Insertion is kind of expensive because we might potentially do a rehash. And the answer is no. What we're going to do is make this at least twice as big. With the idea being here, if I have n values, let's say my load factor, we're going to add, for the sake of example, we'll use, because it's the easy, easiest example to use, we'll have a load factor, for example, of 50%. 
So if my table is 50% full, then I'll rehash it. So that means the table size here, let me not say n values, let me say n over 2 values. So the table size here is n, that means we have n over 2 values before we do a rehash. Well, now the table size is at least 2n here, and I still have n over 2 values. That means this is now 1 fourth full after rehash. If it's half full at the time, then I rehash into a table at least twice as big, then now it's no more than one quarter full. And so it's easier, to, instead of dealing with the inequalities, imagine it's exactly half full and this table is exactly twice as big, things will be exactly one fourth full. The point being now, there's half the table, I need to insert another n over 2 values. They won't all be in the beginning, of course, but I'm just sort of illustrating in terms of sizes. I would need to insert another n over 2 values before the table is full. Or, I'm sorry, before it's half full again. That is, what I have here now, 1 half of 2n is n. And so if the table is going to be half full, I'll need another rehash. The point is, however many values I have in this table now, however many values I had to rehash, I'll need to now do insertions of at least that many values before needing to increase the table size again. And so the analysis that happens here is very similar to the analysis that we had for um, the array implementation of stacks. We talked about amortized analysis or long-term analysis. And I said when I'm adding, when I'm pushing values onto a, a, a array for a stack and then that array becomes full, what I want to do is double the size of the array. And we said, well, double the size of the array. That means now you had n values in an n cell array. Now instead you have n values in a 2n cell array, which means it's half full. And you'll have to push n more values before it's full again. We had said for a stack, you have to copy n values, and that takes order n time. But now you'll have n constant time push operations before things are full. So in a sense, the copying costs are distributed among all the inserts you'd have to do to force another copy. And likewise here, you've rehashed n over 2 values, you know, that's order n over 2 time, but now we'll have to do what we expect on average would be constant time insertions, n over 2 of them, the same number of insertions to get to the point where we need another rehash. So however much time we took to go from the old table to the new table, we would need the same amount of time to go from a just barely created new table to a new table in need of rehashing again. And so the time to do the rehashing once can be thought of as being distributed over all the same number of insertions we'd have to do to reach that point again. Just like with that stack analysis. I have an order n over 2 operation, which is order n, but however we have an op uh, operation that requires n over 2 rehashings, now we'll require n over 2 insertions before reaching that point again. So the time to do the rehashing is, in a sense, distributed over the, the number of constant time insertions that we will have before needing another rehash. And so the point is the rehashing doesn't really matter any more than the stack increase did back when we did uh, the stack analysis. The point being... Um, that uh, if we were doing a rehashing after every step, it would matter, but the way we're setting things up, we expect to always have enough insertions to counter the effect of the rehashing. And likewise with that stack, we expect to do, do enough push operations at constant time that it sort of uh, swallowed up the cost of the occasional stack increase. And so that's how rehashing would work. We make the table at least twice as big. We could, of course, make it 10 times as big, too, if we wanted, but that's chewing up more memory than we need. The question is, we want to have enough memory to get decent performance. If we make the table at least twice as big, then that'll be a nice compromise. You know, we get good performance, keep the table large enough while not using up huge amounts of memory and while still allowing us to have a decent time to adjust for this, this situation, which was getting a little bit too, too cramped. And so that's the issue there. Now, of course, we want to have a prime table size as well. So typically what we'll do is say we're going to have something at least 
twice as big, and then it needs to be prime as well. So we wouldn't settle for exactly twice as big. We'd sort of ratchet the number up to the next largest prime. So if we had seven cells, we might then say that goes to 17 cells the next time because we double the table to size 14 and then, um, then ratchet up to 17. And likewise, with a cell size 17 table, we could double it to 34 and then move it up to 37, which would be the next largest prime. And you can either keep track of those primes in some table or calculate them yourself or whatever. But how, however you code it up, whether they're stored in advance or not, you would have, you'd want to find that prime or have your table, your rehashing function in your hash table class have access to those primes to be able to, um, to uh, deal with that. And so that's all there is to say for uh, the basic kinds of hashing we talked about. We talked about the hash function. We talked about open hashing and closed hashing and the different kinds of probings involved in closed hashing. And then this rehashing idea works for both open and closed hashing. And it would be how we would adjust the table once the load factor indicates the table's too full. And that's about it. Uh, that's all there is to say for the, the regular hashing. What we're now going to start, and we'll sort of finish up um, on uh, the next time, is extendable hashing. And extendable hashing is a little bit different. Uh, we still have the same idea of a hash function, but the table was designed to grow more gracefully. The intention here was to say, you know, the uh, way we've got things working out now, we've got a particular hash function, and as the table fills up, we have to sort of create a new hash function, even if it's nothing more than simply saying, well, by changing the size, we change the hash function from x mod 7 to x mod 17. The point is, though, since the size has changed, the hash function has changed, and we rehash everything using the new function and put it in a new table. What would be nice would be if we had a table that could grow in size a little more gracefully than sort of a brute force restructure for a whole brand new table, rehash everything. And that was the motivation behind people starting to mess around with you know, how extendable hashing might work. And it turns out there's some really nice properties for this. The important idea, though, will be our hash function. We will hash in a key and get a bit string. Often that could be, say, the uh, uh, size of a machine word, for example. So we can have, you know, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, blah, blah, blah. Let's say, you know, maybe this is 32 bits. Our examples we'll tend to use 8 bits or 6 bits just to keep them small. Just like for B trees we talked about, you know, the order will normally be something large, but we'll tend to keep a, a, small, a small order just for the sake of, um, you know, examples and such. Same thing here. You know, typically we have a larger bit string. We'll just deal with smaller bit strings. The idea here, though, is going to be that we need, as we talked about early, a, a uh, even distribution for this hash function. And the question is, how does an even distribution apply here? And the key is going to be, no pun intended, that we don't want to rehash our keys to these bit strings over and over and over and over and over again. We want the bit string to serve as an index no matter how big the table is. And of course, the whole bit string can't serve as an index. That doesn't work for us. Because, you know, if we, we don't want to have, or at least don't want to necessarily start with a 2 to the 32 minus 1 as a maximum index. We don't want to have, you know, if, if we have 32-bit numbers as indices, then that's a 32 to the 32 sized table, which is very large. It may not even fit in, in, in your memory. Um, so the idea will be what we'd like is to hash on one bit string, but have that bit string serve as multiple indices. And the question is, how on earth could we do that? And the answer is by considering different prefixes. Let's say this is the start of my bit string. I'm just writing it a little, little larger so we can see it. Now, if I take a one bit prefix, my results are either going to be 0 or 1. I have two different indices there. If I take a two bit prefix, 
my results are going to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. That is, I have four different indices comp composed of the binary numbers 0 through 3. If I take a 3-bit index, my results are going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 3-bit prefix, rather, 0, 1, 0, all the way down to 1, 1, 1. The eight binary numbers, 0 through 7. And so on. I can take this bit string and look at prefixes of different lengths and get, get different index collections. If on all my bit strings I look at a prefix of length 1, I have two possible indices. If on all my bit strings I look on a prefix of, of length 2, I have four possible bit strings, four possible prefixes, four possible in array indices. If I look at prefixes of length 5, there will be 32 possible bits, so such bit strings for prefixes, 32 possible binary numbers that are 5 bits long, therefore 30, 32 possible array indices. That is, with extendable hashing, the array size will be, we'll see this in a moment ourselves in the, in the actual picture, the array size will be a power of 2. The array size will be 2 or 4 or 8 or 16 or 32 or 64. And then the uh, index range will be then 0 to 63 or 0 to 31 or 0 to 7 or 0 to 15, 0 to 2 to the whatever minus 1. And we get those indices by looking at a certain uh, length prefix on our bit strings. So therefore, once I hash the key to a bit string, once I have that bit string, I then only need to look at the prefix of that bit string, and that tells me my index. And therefore, the same bit string serves as a number of different indices, an index into a size 2 table, an index into a size 4 table, an index into a size 8 table, an index into a size 16 table, and so on, simply by looking at the prefix of whatever length, 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or whatever. And so that means I hash once, and then I'm, I'm sort of all set after that. So what's important then is that we have an even distribution, no matter how big our table size is, which means that what we want then is to say, well, I want half my numbers to start with 0, and I want half my numbers to start with 1 when I hash. Out of all the bit strings I would generate by passing keys and hashing to create bit strings, half of those bit strings should start with 0, half of them should start with 1. In addition, my second bit, if my first bit is 0, half of the second bit should be 0, half of them should be 1. That is, one-fourth of my bit strings should start with 0, 0, and one-fourth of them should start with 0, 1. Similarly, given all these strings that start at 1, I want half of them to, start, to have 0 as the second bit, and half of them to have 1 as the second bit. Therefore, we're saying one-fourth of my bit strings should start with 1, 0, and one-fourth of them should start with 0, 1. Or 1, 1, I'm sorry. And we'll continue this idea, because now I say, okay, I'm evenly distributed among all the 1-bit prefixes, and therefore the 1-bit indices. I'm also evenly distributed among all the 2-bit prefixes, and therefore the indices 0 to 3. Similarly, I want then an equal division of the next ones as well. So out of all the ones that start with 0, 0, I want half of them to have 0 in the third bit and half of them to have 1 in the third bit. And likewise, with the rest of these, meaning I want 0, 0, 0 to occur 1 eighth of the time, 0, 0, 1 to occur 1 eighth of the time, 0, 1, 0 to occur 1 eighth of the time, 0, 1, 1 to occur 1 eighth of the time, 1, 0, 0 to occur 1 eighth of the time, 1, 0, 1 to occur 1 eighth of the time, and you're getting the idea.
So the different 3-bit prefixes should each occur one-eighth of the time. Again, because we say given a particular 2-bit prefix, if I consider the 3-bit prefixes, if out of all these strings that start with that particular 2-bit prefix, half of them will have 0 in the 3rd bit, half of them will have 1 in the 3rd bit. And if we do that, if the 2-bit prefix occurs 1 fourth of the time, and its 3rd bit is 0 half the time and 1 half the time, then that means that each of those 3-bit th uh, prefixes would occur 1 eighth of the time, because together they form the 1 fourth of the time that we start with, for example, 1 1. 1 1 occurs 1 fourth of the time, half of those are 1 1 0, half of them are 1 1 1. And so that's what we'll want. And so this is in contrast to saying something like, you know, we could have said, it could have been, you know, this would be the example of something that's bad, one half of the strings start with zero, one half of them start with one. But when we look at the second bit, one half of them start with zero, zero, none of them start with zero, one, one eighth start with one, zero, and three eighths start with one, one. And then we say when we look at three bits, one half of them start with zero, zero, zero. None of them start with zero, zero, one. None of them start with zero, one, zero, or zero, one, one, because none of them started with zero, one in the first place. So it doesn't really matter what the third bit is. That, that, sec that pattern of two bits didn't occur. And then we say one sixteenth of these are one, zero, zero, and one sixteenth are one, zero, one, and three eighths are one, one, zero, and none of them are one, one, one. That would be a bad distribution. And so instead what we want is one half for each of those, yes. Because we haven't violated anything here. This is still, you know, together they form one fourth or one half of the items that start with one. Likewise, one half of the things start with zero, one, this should be one sixteenth, not one sixth. Likewise here, one half of the items start with one. So these probabilities are kept. We're just saying that as we review more information, the distribution gets worse. But we still have half of everything starting with zero, just like we said in the beginning, and half of everything starting with one, just like we said. And half starts with zero, zero. None of them start with zero, one. One-eighth of them start with one, zero. Three-eighths start with one, one, just like we said. So the distributions are still accurate. We're just saying that as the, you know, the further number of bits we look at, the worse the distributions get over our, set of, our, our new set of possible indices. And we don't want that. We want to be divided half and half in one bit, one quarter for each when it's two bits, one eighth for each when it's three bits, and so on. And so that's the kind of hash function we need. We need a hash function that will have that distribution for us so that no matter how many bits we're looking at for the prefix, we still have an even distribution over the prefixes of that many bits. Given that setup, then we can make an extendable hash table work. So keep that in mind as we talk about this, that that's going to be how the table is set up. I'll draw such a table. The table is going to be called directory, and we say it has depth, which we'll notate with a capital D. And so that's the idea here. We say D equals 3. We're going to start out, and never mind for the moment how we got to this point. We're going to talk about insertion on this table uh, next time. What we're concerned with now is just how the table itself is structured so and how, how we would manage lookups. So D will be 3. What we're going to say, this will be true all the time, we said the size is a power of 2. The size is always going to be 2 to the D. So what we have here is, here's our table. Since D is 3, the size is 8. And so I have here 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Those are my eight indices for my table because it's size 8. 
so the indices are 0 through 7. And there will be a few rules about this. The first rule, of course, is the table size is uh, double or is 2 to the, the depth of the table size. So what we're saying then is the depth of the table size, or I'm sorry, the, the depth of the table or the depth of the directory will be the prefix that we concern ourselves with, the size of the prefix that index, indexes this table. So if the depth had been 4, then we're saying we use 4-bit prefixes to index the table, and therefore, the, um, as a result, the table then is going to be size 16. If the depth of the directory was 2 or the depth of the table was 2, that means we use, the table size would be 4. We have 4 cells. We use 2-bit uh, strings to index a table of size 4. So that's why we have that relation. This is telling us the length of the bit string we use to index the table. And so by extension then, given d bits, you have 2 to the d possibilities for that number of bits, and then, therefore, 2 to the d cells. Now each of these cells is going to point to something. None of them can ever be null, and that's a common mistake that's made, so don't make that mistake. This is going to be known as a leaf page. Or we can also call it a node, and I'll say that informally as well. The formal definition is leaf page. And then we can have another leaf page here. And another leaf page here. And another leaf page here. Now, there's going to be some extra information we'll need to add to the table, um, and we're going to run out of time before that. So, um, the table actually won't have all the details it needs until the start of the next lecture. Um, I just want to give you the basic idea of how this works first, and then we'll flesh out the rest of the details next time. Similar to how we didn't really talk for closed hashing about the uh, delete bit, the delete field, the, the empty valid delete field, until the next lecture. What I will tell you now, though, is that inside these leaf pages, what we have are the bit strings. Plus, perhaps tied in with those bit strings, we'd have a pointer to some record. And so we might have here the bit string 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. I'll make them um, 6 bits rather than 8, and that way they're going to be, if I make it too, too long as a bit string, I'll have to cram it together and you won't be able to read it off the video. So I'll make them 6, our examples will be 6 bits. So the idea here is we have some bit string, our key hash to a bit string, that bit, bit string goes in a node. And then we might perhaps also associated with this happen to have a pointer to some record of some kind. Don't worry about that. You know, it's the same thing like when we said, when we hit a B tree leaf, the leaf holds 19. What would the leaf would really hold in reality would be 19 and the record that we 19 is a key for, or 19 and a pointer to that record. You know, we look up your social security number. We're not just doing that to see if that social security number is around. It's to ha retrieve a record with that social security number. So we have that idea here, just like we might have you know, the, the key info pairs here. We're storing a key info pair, where the key is your bit string and the info is a pointer to some record. Um, but as with B trees and anything else we did, we're going to ignore that and just focus on the actual structure and just keep in mind that once you obtain your key, that would then be used to grab the associated record. But that's a detail we don't need to draw into every single picture, so I'm just letting you know about it now and then keep it in the back of your mind. So the idea here will now be that we say, okay, let's say we have now here 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. And I'm going to quickly draw some keys in here. And so what you might notice now in this picture is every single key, every single bit string in these nodes matches the prefix of one of the pointers that points to it. That is, the three-bit prefix here is 000, which is fine because the 000 cell points to that. The prefix here is 011, no problem, the 011 cell points to that. The prefix here is, zero, or is 100, that matches what points to it. 101, and here 10 or 111 both point to that node. So we're saying every single prefix has to point to some node. Every node is going to be pointed to by one or more pointers from the table. The idea for lookup is going to be that in order to look up a bit string, or in order to look up a value in the table, you'd hash to the bit string. So if I want to look up, you know, Bob in the table, I hash on Bob and get my bit string. 
I look at that many pre bits of the bit string, so the, the three bit prefix in this case. Whatever bit string I get when I hash on Bob, I get this 32 or 64 bit string or whatever. I look at the first three bits, that's my prefix. Go to that cell in the table. So if my prefix is 001, I go to cell 001. If the prefix is cell 111, I go to cell 111, and so on. And follow that pointer to the node. And I'm guaranteed that what I'm looking for is in that node or nowhere else. That is, whatever node 000 points to, everything that has 000 as a prefix will be in that node, in that leaf page. Whatever leaf page 100 points to, every string that has 100 as a prefix will be in that leaf page. Whatever leaf page 110 points to, every leaf page, or I'm sorry, every bit string that has that pre particular prefix will be in that leaf page, nowhere else. And so that's what we managed to do here. What we're essentially saying is you only need to look at one leaf page when I do a lookup. The table says anything with that prefix is in that particular leaf page. Oh, you're looking for something with prefix 001? All of those would be, follow the pointer, in this leaf page. So search that leaf page for it. Don't bother looking at either of these three. One, zero, 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 001 is not pointing to the, any of those three leaf pages, so nothing that starts with zero, zero, 001 could be in any of those three leaf pages. Only what zero, zero, 001 points to, that leaf page, that's the only thing that can hold strings with prefix zero, zero, 001. And so when you're doing a lookup, you go from the table to a particular leaf page. That's the only leaf page you need to look at. And then you search it, and if your bit string is inside that leaf page, then it will turn out to be a successful search. And if your bit string's not in the leaf page, it will turn out to be an unsuccessful search. But if you have an unsuccessful search in that leaf page, you don't need to go searching the other ones. You grab your leaf page that the table points to, and you say, search this. I either find my string in this page, or I don't. And that's how we do lookups in the table. If we find a string, of course, then you know, we can go ahead and grab the, the pointer of the record or whatever it is we're trying to do. If we don't find it, then whatever, we return null or whatever it is our function would have us do. But we somehow not, not, notate yeah, that I found the bit string or I didn't. And so that's the idea here. Now what's going to happen, the critical concept here, is going to be that these leaf pages have to have a bound on their size. Because otherwise, you look at this and you think, well, what's the big deal? You've got four leaf pages. As you dump things that hash to 000 for a prefix, or 001, or 110, or whatever, you're just going to dump resultant values in the leaf page. And that's how insertions will tend to work. If I insert a new string, for example, that hashes to 100, I say, well, 100000, let's say, is what I want to insert. prefix of that is 100. So just as I wanted to search this node for anything starting with 100, therefore, if I want to insert something new starting with 100, it should go in that node. That's the only node I'm going to look in for things that start with 100. So if I want to add something new that starts with 100 and I expect it to ever be found, certainly it should go in that node. I shouldn't put it somewhere where we wouldn't look for it in the first place. So you put follow the prefix match and put 100000 into that node. And those will be the basics of find and remove. Do a find, you grab your bit string, look at the appropriate prefix, find that prefix in the table, and move to that node. To do insertions, you say, look at the prefix, find that prefix in the table, go to that node, insert the um, uh, string in that node. And if we did that indefinitely, then this would become a useless structure because we're simply saying, OK, instead of searching a whole collection of all my strings, I'm searching a collection of maybe one-fourth of them or whatever. You know, that I say, OK, um, or, or, you know, I've divided my, my bit strings into, a group, into four different groups, some of which might ultimately be smaller than other groups. But we say, OK, now you search one of the groups. Well, even if we have things ideally distributed over the four nodes, that would still be you know, an order to, the N four, order to the N over 4 search, which is order N. So just indiscriminately dumping bit strings into one of these four nodes is going to be useless, because then the nodes get larger and larger and larger, and it takes longer and longer and longer to search them. What we want is to have a bound on the size of these nodes. So what's going to have to happen then is, 
when a node gets too full, it will need to split. And the key is distributed over the two new nodes. And then we have to adjust the table and adjust some of the information we keep track of. And that will be the idea that we're dealing with here. So we'll look at that tomorrow, the procedure for splitting these nodes. But the idea will be that if this node gets too big, if I dump more stuff into here and I need to split the node, none of these are affected. The table may or may not be affected, but none of these nodes would be affected. And so our, our alterations would be limited to just a local alteration. We'd have to change the node that got too full, the leaf page that got too full. We might, as we'll see tomorrow or in the next lecture, have to change the table as well. We won't need to mess with all the other nodes. So unlike the regular hashing where we had to rehash everything, in this case, there's just small parts of the data structure we need to change when we insert that last value that makes it too full. We won't need to change everything. And that'll be nice. It's a little bit of a more gradual change. Um, you know, when, when the table needs to be readjusted or when certain things need to be readjusted, we just make local readjustments. The entire table and all its leaf pages don't need to be restructured. And so the, uh, the, the change in the, in the hash table in this case is a little bit more graceful. And so that will be the idea. Now, where this is a value, um, you might think, well, how small do we want to make these leaf pages? There's still the idea of having to search the leaf page for a long time. This will be the last fact I, I sit, state before I, I, uh, I stop the lecture. Um, actually, I think I won't. I think we're out of time. So what I will do is I'll leave you to think about where this might be useful. There's this idea of saying, well, yeah, it's only one pointer access to get to a leaf page node. But now um, we have to search that whole leaf page node. And however large we make it, it still could be kind of large to search, take a while to search. You know, let's say we make it, we can make it two, you know, have a, a bound of two and say only fit two keys or only fit four keys or fit 100 keys or fit 200 keys. Whatever we're going to do, the larger we make that leaf page, the more time it would make, take to search. And I'm going to say there might be some occasions where that search time wouldn't matter too much to us. The time to search a leaf page would not be quite so important as the ability to um, grab that leaf page from the table. And I'll start there next time, so I'll sort of leave that as the unanswered question for you to think about until you start the next lecture, whether immediately or whether you start it you know, a day from now or whatever. So that's it. Uh, well, next time we'll, we'll finish up extendable hashing, and, um, and uh, then that will conclude hashing completely. See you then.